Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed the previous session where we heard from Nathan, author and former CPO and global well-being leader on authenticity and resilience. And I really, really enjoyed that session and I'm super excited to jump into the next one. So for those of you who are just joining now, good morning and welcome to the Mental Health Festival 2023 presented by Intellect. My name is Linda and I will be your host this morning. Now let's turn our focus to our next session called Destigmatizing Mental Health Challenges in the Workplace. What more can be done at the organizational level? In this speaker, in this session, our speaker, Professor Young, will share the priority areas he and his team plan to address at the organizational level to progressively destigmatize mental health challenges and provide timely person-centered support. Professor Young is currently the group chief nurse and chief wellness officer at National Health Care Group and carries close to 27 years of experience in the nursing field, where he has played a pivotal role in strategic planning, manpower development, clinical operations, and of course, quality management. He oversees the professional development of around 8,000 nurses while spearheading efforts to enhance the well-being of NHG's 22,000 staff. These are quite some impressive numbers, and I've had a peek at Professor Young's presentation, and I have to say I'm, I have a feeling that we're in for a treat. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Young to the stage. Over to you. Hey, Linda. Uh, thank you. Can I have the, my slides, please? The next slide, please. Good morning, one and all. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay. I had some technical issues. I'm glad to be here now. So a little bit about myself, um, parent of three, I was trained in UK, I've been uh, working as a nurse for 27 over years. Uh, next slide, please. Then recently, I was asked to take up a concurrent post as the uh, Chief Wellness Officer in National Healthcare Group. Uh, it was a uh, timely that uh, a rabbit in somewhere in uh, Los Angeles was also appointed the Chief Wellness Officer. It makes me wonder what I'm for. But actually, it has been a, a, a great uh, journey of learning since I was appointed. I, I never realized that uh, I, I know only superficially about this topic. And I'm glad to have learned more uh, with the help of my colleagues. Next slide, please. Uh, just a bit about NHG. Um, today, we are part of, uh, we are one of the three public health clusters in Singapore. And uh, within NHG, we have 22,000 staff. Next slide, please. And uh, these are the uh, institutions that's under the flagship of NHG. And we have a suite of uh, acute hospitals, a cluster of uh, acute hospitals, uh, uh, specialist hospitals like the Institute of Mental Health, uh, and then polyclinics. Next slide, please. So today, what I'll be sharing is on uh, what are some of the staff well-being measures that have already been instituted at uh, NHG which uh, some of them have been ongoing for a long time. Uh, then as a CWO, as a newly minted CWO, uh, Chief Wellness Officer, I have some views of uh, what we could do better at the organization level. I'm not an expert. I mean, despite me being clinically trained, I'm not an expert in mental health, uh, to be honest. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of experts here who will be able to um, uh, explain more on that. But for me, my focus is on organization level. What could we do at the organization level uh, from my, wearing my lens as an organization leader? Next slide, please. So staff well-being, uh, just to start off, is, has always been on our mind. And uh, especially we are we are healthcare organization. And I'm going to start you some examples for me being a nurse leader uh, over the last 20 over years. Next slide, please. So resignation rates in the last two, three years over COVID has been particularly high uh, for the nursing group. And it has been worryingly high because uh, compared with COVID, uh, before uh, COVID-19, we were at least 50% higher. And, that's, and resignation rate is something that we don't undermine or uh, um, uh, underestimate at all. Next slide, please. 
in healthcare, we uh, other than looking uh, at some of the healthcare aims that you will not be surprised of, whether it's improving patient experience, better health outcomes, or lower cost of care, uh, there has been a shift from looking at the triple aim that I just spoke of to the quadruple aim, which is the fourth one is the improved staff experience. Uh, this is a movement that has also been started at the US Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Next slide, please. And under the quadruple aim, uh, there was this framework that's been introduced called Join Work. And many healthcare organizations uh, in Singapore, uh, including National Healthcare Group, subscribe to it. Uh, we look at it, we like it because it look at the responsibility and accountability of the senior leaders, the managers and core leaders, as well as the individuals. Everybody plays a part uh, into looking at the uh, joy of work or the professional, the profo professional fulfillment of everyone and all who works in a healthcare organization. So this is about happy, healthy, productive people. Next slide, please. And within this framework, a series of uh, initiatives that have been carried out, and mostly by uh, all the healthcare organizations as well. In healthcare organizations, we look at just culture. We look at, uh, because when we deal with patients, we deal with humans, uh, there can be quite a, a quite a, a, and uh, when care is very complex, human errors can happen. And we have to find a good way to give a bit, uh, to give fairness to the whole process of uh, investigation and closure of the incident. And so, mental health in these uh, areas are very important uh, when we deal with such incidents. Next slide, please. And organizations, in this case from Yishun Health, uh, there are there are processes, there are frameworks to allow people to speak up when they experience distress at work, distress in terms of ethical distress, in terms of work distress, in a way that they see that certain care demands are not well met, uh, and they being in the forefront of clinical care, uh, they need to elevate, uh, escalate it to people who can deal with the issue at hand. And so there's framework like safety code here done at Yishun Health, where enable staff at the psychological safety to speak up. Next slide, please. Um, then there is a second victim framework, also part of the uh, um, equality movement in, in, within healthcare, where we acknowledge that in uh, incidents involving patients where there's patient harm, our staff uh, are equally distressed by it, whether the, uh, especially when most of the incidents uh, were not intentional. And so there are three levels of support that we basically most of the organizations were introduced uh, within the, the uh, within the organization and at level one it's about how staff and peers and supervisors can support at level two is seeking going escalating it up to peer support uh, pre, uh, um, uh, departments or, or, or set up can help uh, one another when they are they are they're the ones who have been trained and of course there's also at level two there's also employee assistance program uh, that will support the staff if they want some privacy uh, they want some um, um, the providers to be a, a neutral party so uh, and then there's level three where a uh, more professional level of support can be provided for those who require a deeper level of support uh, next slide please So here we give you examples of how, uh, at, as a nurse leader previously, uh, when I was at uh, Nursing Hospital, we came up, we have come up with various measures to ensure that staff are aware that uh, we want to take, uh, if they encounter mental health challenges or dealing with uh, patient incidents or incidents involving patients or care incidents, uh, there are mechanisms for them to seek help. And these are examples that you see here where we attend at the uh, organization level, at the department level, at the division level, how we offer support to the nurses who are at frontline. Next slide, please. Uh, at IMH, uh, another institution, we also deal with, uh, um, we also look at mental health support for people who are victims of uh, assaults or verbal or physical abuse. Uh, so this, what you see here are examples of how um, staff can seek support or the level of support that can be provided to them. Uh, and most organizations, again, have such frameworks in place. Next slide, please. But we don't only deal with uh, um, um, uh, 
the abuse and harassment from the external perpetrators. We also look at incivility, um, abuse and harassment within the organization, where it's between staff to staff. And so uh, workplace bullying is also one of the areas that as a nurse leader, as a department leader, we watch out for to make sure that we protect. Again, we attend to the mental health uh, challenges of those who uh, need this level of support. I'm just going to wait for the rest of my slides to be up and then I'll continue. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, so other than those, the specific uh, uh, initiatives that are targeted at specific areas of uh, mental health challenges, we uh, as an organization leader, as a division leader for nursing in particular, we pay attention to staff engagement to make sure that we have a, we keep a pulse on the, uh, the, uh, emotion, the, the challenges that uh, nurses face at frontline, whether it's a physical challenges or a mental health challenges. So we depend on technology or social media platform to reach out to them. We look at ground up peer support, we look at multiple ways of recognition. Next slide, please. Uh, and at the uh, organization, at the division level, we also look at shared governance where we want to give nurses at all levels a voice to make sure that they can raise any issues anytime uh, to any of the leaders. In other words, we want to make sure that the staff has a psychological safety to bring up any issues. Next slide, please. And in shared governance, next slide, please. And in shared governance, uh, we look at uh, shared decision making, shared accountability, and for staff leaders to have a constant collaboration, again, to break any barriers of communication or any fears of bringing up issues and really to uh, get, provide the psychological safety for people to interact openly with one another. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is again another visual uh, a de a depiction of what shared governance is about, basically about self giving a, a, a diluting the power gradient and allowing people, uh, uh, making it uh, facilitating uh, a more open uh, uh, exchange of ideas and, uh, and, and discussion of issues or challenges at hand. Next slide, please. Uh, what we also pay attention to is the fact that how we look at promoting our leaders who are able to facilitate an environment for people to interact openly. Uh, while previously in the healthcare organization especially, we, uh, we have a high emphasis on competence, which I guess many of you will not be surprised of. We are increasingly focusing on the fact that uh, on the, uh, the skills and competence related to engagement uh, uh, and to um, relationship building. Next slide, please. And that's why you see that in many leadership training that we do, uh, especially this is one that is from the uh, Ministry of Health Holdings uh, Leadership Framework, uh, there are more and more emphasis on building relationships, empowerment, and inspiring others. And all these points to our efforts and investments to make sure that we attend to the mental health uh, of our colleagues, uh, of the people that are working within the organization. Next slide, please. But we could do better for mental well-being. What I've spoke about, many things that we have done to make sure that we give uh, enough emphasis and attention to the mental health of our colleagues, the mental well-being of our colleagues. I think when I took on the role as a CWO, I noticed that at uh, organization level, there are areas we could do better. Next slide, please. As you can see here, uh, I feel that we can be more person-centric. There are focused areas for support. Uh, well, that has been in place, but translation to practice will need more work. Uh, we are looking at scaling up to provide more adequate access. Uh, and more importantly, we want to be able to measure our work, to know that we are successful in, with our measures, with our initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. So at, a, at any the well-being framework that we undertake in a healthcare organization like NHG, the one that we've shown here is from a colleague from a TTSH, uh, Dr. Hospital. Uh, basically, whether it's physical or mental uh, well-being, 
uh, we look at maintaining the well-being or wellness of the staff on the left side of the spectrum uh, to be able to detect them if any of our colleagues are in distress, whether physically or mentally. And then if they do go into the phase of a dis dysfunction, then the efforts will be put in to make sure that we could recover, help them recover. Uh, uh, and then while we stay accountable to the individual and to the healthcare uh, service that we are running. Uh, next slide, please. And if we translate this to a mental health, mental well-being framework, it will look like this from level one to level four, as you can see from wellness to dysfunction. We want to intervene at level one, level two, be able to offer support at level one, level two, level three, and level four. Most of our work today are in level one. We have started a lot of work in level two, uh, but in terms of accessibility and consistency, there will be areas that we need to work harder. Uh, and for level three and level four are areas that are services that exist, but again, there are gaps that we could plug. Next slide, please. And to illustrate that, right, level one support uh, is about increasing staff and supervisors when there are signs of distress and mental health conditions uh, of our fellow colleagues. Uh, while everybody is keen to look out for one another, they may not be well equipped with skills and competence to do so. We intend to beef up uh, these aspects, um, especially in a healthcare organization where we pride ourselves to be able to recognize the well being of our people, especially from the angle of health. Uh, next slide, please. At level two, there are peer support programs that, uh, uh, that are in place in every organization within NHG, uh, but there are uh, uh, best practices we can look at for one another uh, and uh, harmonizing and standardizing some of these practices, especially in terms of escalation of flows, response times, operating hours, uh, and support with incident investigation, if any. And more importantly, we want a consistent capability for our PSP coordinators or those who are part of this program. Uh, next slide, please. At level two support, uh, we also have some employee assistance programs in place in some of our organizations, and we're looking to uh, uh, to extend that coverage to all our staff. Um, and more importantly, we know that EAP service is good to complement our peer support program because it offers neutrality, offers a, a third party uh, support for a staff who require, who will prefer anonymity. Uh, and that hopefully that will overcome any barrier to seek help. Next slide, please. At, at laboratory support, we would like to think that because we have in-house professional support services, we have psychiatrists with us, we have psychologists with us, we have counselors with us, uh, we should be okay, right? Uh, again, we realize that in, in terms of these areas, because many of these services are targeted at providing a more patient funding, we have to set aside resources to make sure that our staff are also well covered. But again, the question of uh, the issue of anonymity and privacy is an important one for us to consider because not all our staff would prefer to seek uh, professional support in house. Next slide, please. And finally, at level four support, there are questions about how do we manage the conundrum between job security versus fitness to work. Uh, and so these are questions that we have to handle as the organization as we do more and more uh, with uh, the mental health challenges that we are committed to, to uh, attend to. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my final slide. Sorry uh, to have taken quite a bit of time. Um, basically, it's still early in my journey, uh, but I'm glad that I have a, 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 a group of people, a dedicated people who have been doing this for a while, and now uh, supporting me and advising me on how to get this work done in a more consistent uh, uh, and sustainable manner. Thank you very much for uh, your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Yong. What a great note to end the session on. Thank you for illuminating this vital subject. It's been really insightful and we've gotten lots and lots of amazing questions. Since we're a bit over time, we can only really squeeze in one question. So I'll pick out this one. I thought it was quite interesting. You've talked about lots of different concepts and I think it seems like we would benefit from an example as well. So one of the question is, what is the most common mental health challenge experience at NHG and how does the organization address it? What is the most common one? The, when I took on the job, uh, okay, so previously when we, when I was a, as a nurse leader, I, uh, 
One of the more common ones is associated with work demands, uh, the matching of uh, workload and the available resources. Um, and this is a fairly common one and there are, there, are, there are people handling on a daily basis because it can come out on a daily basis. But what is becoming uh, uh, also important for me to look at is that there are, because we are onboarding quite a number of uh, people who are new to healthcare services uh, and healthcare is getting more complex, there are more and more people who experience workplace work anxiety, anxiety associated with the work that they sign up for. Uh, what they train and what they do at work uh, is a bit of a, uh, a cultural uh, appreciation. Or, sorry, let me rephrase that. There's a bit of a, a transition uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, so we are increasingly trying to help this group of people to adapt to the work and uh, perhaps find, do a bit more of a job match for them. So uh, this is an increasing area of work uh, um, um, other than dealing with work, work but it's the fact that the work itself is not uh, the way they expected when they're learning at school. Okay. Thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. What a wonderful discussion. Let's carry this knowledge and this inspiration into our workplaces, into our communities. Hopefully we can continue these conversations and work towards a bit more of a compassionate future as well. Thank you so much, Professor Yong. And Thank I so saw much. a couple more questions about rewatching this session. If you'd like to rewatch or share the session, the recording will be made available to you on the events platform and on our YouTube page as well. Now, after hearing from caregivers from a corporate to a healthcare setting, let's shift our focus to hear from some regional leaders in the employee benefits space on strategies for navigating regulatory landscapes, measuring program success, and fostering inclusive well-being. We have two more sessions lined up before the break. So to join our next session, it's called From Global Vision to Local Action, Well-Being Implementation Strategy at a Market Level. All you need to do is go ahead and click the join button for this uh, 11.06 a.m. session when you're back in the lobby. Lastly, please complete the short survey that we have. It's just five questions. We would love to hear your feedback and take that into account for our future events. Now, thank you so much for being part of this engaging discussion, and I will see you over in our next session.